The next item of business is a statement by Michael Russell on progress in establishing the Citizens' Assembly of Scotland, Scotland's constitutional future. The Cabinet Secretary will take questions at the end of his statement, so there should be no interventions or interruptions. And I call on Michael Russell. Ten minutes, please, Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, Presiding Officer, on the 24th of April, the First Minister announced a range of actions to take forward consideration of Scotland's constitutional future. I updated the Chamber on progress on the 29th of May. I'm pleased to honour the commitment I made then to do so again before recess. Of course, events over the last two months indicate that the questions over our constitutional future are becoming ever more urgent. In April, Donald Tusk urged the UK government not to waste the additional time agreed by the EU27. But that is, of course, precisely what the UK government has done. It's 11 weeks since the Commons last voted on Brexit, two months since it last looked at a Brexit SSI, four weeks since it heard a Brexit statement. And the reality of this Brexit chaos is still being denied, a denial which led inter alia to European elections in which many thousands of our fellow EU citizens were denied their democratic right to participate. Only after her party's historic drubbing in those elections did the Prime Minister face up to the clear, unavoidable truth the truth of her being completely incapable of delivering Brexit. But Tory truth is not infectious, for those now vying to replace her are indulging in the very same fictions and fantasies. Boris Johnson is determined to keep a no-deal exit from the EU, regardless of the consequences on the table, whilst Jeremy Hunt insists that he can secure changes to the Irish backstop. But none of the solutions being offered by this tiresome twosome are in any way real. They've been ruled out again and again by the EU itself. There is no doubt, no doubt at all, that the withdrawal agreement will not be reopened. So against this backdrop and the threat to Scotland's interests, let me assure the Chamber we will continue to consider whether the referendums bill should be accelerated. And if required, we will return to that issue after the recess. Presiding officer, it's clear that a growing number of people in Scotland are seriously considering the issue of independence in the light of the Brexit disaster and the Tory leadership debacle. This government was itself elected on a clear mandate that was triggered three years ago when the people of Scotland voted overwhelmingly to remain in the European Union, a mandate endorsed by a vote of this parliament. This government, like the majority of parties in this parliament, of course, will continue to do whatever we can to halt the rush towards the catastrophe of a no-deal Brexit. Working with other parties, we will continue to campaign for a people's vote on EU membership with the option of remain on the ballot, a step that the people of Scotland overwhelmingly supported in the EU elections. In her statement on the 24th of April, the First Minister invited all the parties to work with the government to explore what common ground there may be between us on changes needed to equip Scotland with the powers it must have for the future. Essentially, this gives all the parties in the Parliament the chance to say what solutions to the current constitutional crisis they would bring forward, short of independence. We continue to engage seriously with the UK about such matters too, for example, through the very unsatisfactory medium of the Joint Ministerial Committee, which will meet again this Friday in the margins of the British Irish Council in Manchester. I am grateful to the three parties which have indicated their willingness to undertake exploratory discussions to put forward their views. I regret that the Liberal Democrats have declined the opportunity so far. The opportunity remains open and will always do so. But let me focus on the third initiative announced by the First Minister, the establishment of the Citizens' Assembly of Scotland. Citizens' Assemblies are becoming an established way for mature democracies to engage with complex and contested issues on an inclusive, informed and respectful basis. That's what we want for Scotland. I was delighted we were able to hold a series of events in the Parliament last week to talk about this issue. I extend again my thanks to Arthur Leary and Sharon Finnegan, the Secretaries to the Constitutional Convention and Citizens' Assembly in Ireland, and to Antti Zakharowski from the Democratic Society for making the time to share their knowledge and expertise with us. I was only sorry I wasn't able to be present owing to illness. Presiding Officer, this Parliament is rightly proud of the first 20 years of our reconvened existence. But democracy doesn't stand still. We have to keep innovating in order to keep moving. And when we see in the Brexit issue a complete breakdown in trust between politicians and people, surely it should inspire all of us, no matter our political allegiance, to find new ways to bring politicians and people together to resolve deep-seated division. 
This government is determined that the people of Scotland are supported to make choices about their future with full access to the facts they need. We want to encourage people to listen and to learn from each other, including those with whom we might otherwise profoundly disagree. And that is what citizens' assemblies can do. But we are also learning about the whole process. So it's right we should move forward a step at a time. Presiding officer, it's important at the outset to establish a clear set of principles which will underpin the work of the Assembly. And I can confirm these principles today. The first is independence from government, including through the appointment of impartial and respected conveners, an arms length secretariat, and expert advisory groups. The secretariat will be located outside Scottish government offices. In addition, we intend to establish a politicians panel for the Assembly to call on as it wishes so that all of the parties in the Parliament, not just the government, are a resource for the work of the Assembly. Transparency. At all levels of the operation of the Assembly, from the framing of the questions to the selection of members and expert witnesses, through to proactive publication and live streaming of deliberative sessions, and clarity about the, what the outputs will be used for. Inclusion. Extending not just to who is invited to take part as members, but also the operations of the Assembly itself. Access. The wider public must be able to see and comment on the work of the Assembly. Stakeholders must feel that they and their interests have a route into the Assembly. Balance. The information used to build members and the wider public's learning must be balanced, credible, and easily understood. Cumulative learning. Embedded into the design of the Assembly to ensure members develop a rich understanding of the issues considered and have time to do so. And finally, open-mindedness. The Assembly will be a forum for open-minded deliberation between participants, ensuring the public see it as a genuine process of inquiry and to help ensure it receives an open-minded response from this Parliament and from the Government. Presiding Officer, I've already touched on the role of conveners. The Government is determined that the Assembly will be led by people trusted and respected across the political spectrum. I say people because I'm committed to having more than one person undertake the role in order to ensure gender balance and to bring a richness of skills and experience to the role. These conveners will be responsible for stewarding, convening, and representing the Assembly. Having spoken to a wide range of people about the role, including seeking views of members and suggestions from across parties in the Parliament, I'm delighted to be able to confirm today that David Martin has agreed in principle to take on one of these roles. David is one of the most widely respected of MEPs, not just in Scotland, but across the European Union. His long service in the European Parliament has been widely recognized and praised. Discussions are continuing with other individuals interested in serving as the co-convener. I will make a further announcement, including updating MSPs in due course. But presiding officer at the heart of the Assembly are its members. On the 14th of June, we launched the invitation to tender for member recruitment. 120 members of the public will be randomly selected to serve. The tender will ensure that the membership will be broadly representative of Scotland's adult population according to age, ethnic group, socio-economic background, geography and political attitude. Members will be drawn from those eligible to vote under the new franchise and be able to attend all of the formal assembly sessions. I hope serving as a member of the assembly will be seen as a privilege, but it's also a responsibility and a commitment. The Assembly will meet over the course of six weekends from late August to spring, which is in line with practice elsewhere. And we're also doing all we can to assure the Assembly is as accessible as possible, including meeting all reasonable expenses incurred, including caring expenses. But we can do more. Learning from the experience of other Assemblies and in line with the advice we have received, in recognition of the time and effort it will take to be involved, we will also offer a small honorarium for participation. Let me now turn to the remit. The First Minister in her statement set out three broad questions that the Assembly should consider. What kind of country are we seeking to build? How can we best overcome the challenges we face, including those arising from Brexit? And what further work should be carried out to give the people the detail they need to make informed choices about the future? In our engagement with experts and practitioners, we've heard a range of views on the remit required to take these questions forward. We've also heard the importance of leaving the Assembly sufficient space to determine its own path while it's also being clear to the Assembly about where decisions are for this chamber and for the wider public to take. <coughs> I think it's fair to recognize that the conveners working with the Assembly members should and will reflect on those views as part of the process. <coughs> it's important that the Assembly is clearly seen to be independent when reflecting on the debate that Scotland needs. This work will be completed with the co-conveners and a remit published over the summer. 
I will ensure members are kept informed at all stages, and as always, my door is open. Presiding officer, in establishing the <coughs> Citizens Assembly of Scotland, we need to do so carefully, thoughtfully, and progressively. Over the course of the summer, we intend to engage widely to promote the Assembly, to encourage those who are invited to participate. A dedicated website for the Citizens Assembly goes live this afternoon. It will grow to contain all information regarding the Assembly and its work. It can be found at citizenassembly.scot. However, more important than anything else is that within the remit that will be set out and with expert support, members of the Assembly, once in place, are free to explore the matters entrusted to them as they see fit. It is right that the Assembly will itself set many of its rules and procedures and decide how to operate. I know that politicians in this Parliament and beyond will respect not just a fair process, but those engaged in the process. We must also ensure that as far as practical, we respect the outcome too. So finally, I confirm today that when this first Citizens' Assembly for Scotland concludes, the Government will ensure that its recommendations contribute to and are seen to contribute to positive steps towards a better collective future. That commitment extends to reviewing and learning from the process and considering whether citizens' assemblies should become part of the next 20 years of Scotland's story. The Cabinet Secretary will now take questions on the issues raised in his statement, and I'll allow around 20 minutes for that. Uh, would those members who wish to ask a question press the request to speak buttons now, please? And I call on Adam Tompkins. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I thank the Minister for early sight of his statement and I uh, welcome him back to his seat. I know he's been unwell. I wish him a full recovery. I thank him also for the arrangements he made last week for engagement with Art O'Leary, Sharon Finnegan and others with direct experience of citizens' assemblies in Ireland. This was a useful uh, process. My view, Presiding Officer, is that there is a role for citizens' assemblies in Scotland. In Scotland, wherever possible, we are governed by representative parliamentary democracy. But there are some issues of public policy that parliamentary democracy has failed or is struggling to address and resolve in Scotland. Effective preventative spend is one. Long-term social care for the elderly is another. Critically, uh, there is cross-party agreement, probably all party agreement, that these are massive and pressing issues of public policy that we as a parliament struggle with. And were matters such as these to be handed to a citizens' assembly, that may very well be an innovation worthy of support. But sadly, presiding officer, this is not what the SNP propose. What they propose is yet another national conversation on Scotland's constitutional future. We've heard it all before, and here we go again. Last week, we learned that one of the lessons from Ireland uh, is that to be effective, citizens' assemblies need cross-party buy-in at the beginning of the process. Well, this one does not have that. This is not a genuine attempt. At a, as, at a citizens' assembly in Scotland. It's a nationalist stunt to kickstart the conversation about independence. And as such, presiding officer, I'm afraid that we will have nothing to do with it. And I urge all unionists in Scotland to see this for what it is and to give it a wide berth. Uh, was there a question, M Mr. Tom? Your call, Cabinet uh, Secretary? Uh, well, I regret that remark. Uh, I, I think it's entirely contrary to uh, what I have said and the information that's been provided. I hope in time the, uh, the Scottish Conservative Party will realise that there is an importance in looking at this issue. I, I do think it's a, a little rich for, for Mr Tompkins to be condemning the SNP for some sort of constitutional obsession. It seems to me it was the Conservatives who encouraged the referendum to take place three years ago that has led the European referendum to the most extraordinary constitutional crisis in my lifetime. And it's not enough for Adam Tompkins to pretend it doesn't exist or to try and brush it under the carpet. I gave some statistics in my statement about how the House of Commons is paralyzed by Brexit. We've also got the extraordinary spectacle of seeing two people whom, frankly, I would not send for the messages vying to be Prime Minister. In all, in all, those, in all those circumstances, I think Madam Tompkins has taken the wrong view, and I hope he will change his mind because the, the Citizens' Assembly is designed to help Scotland, not hinder it. I hope the Scottish Tories see that as their aim too. Claire Baker. Uh, thank you, President Officer, and I thank the Cabinet Secretary for an advanced sight of the statement. First, can I welcome the appointment of David Martin as one of the co-conveners and wish him well in his role. 
I welcome the principles of autonomy of the Assembly from government and open-mindedness. But to have announced a citizens' assembly at the same time as a referendum bill has certainly created the impression that the government has already provided the answer. How is the, govern how is the government going to ensure a genuine process of inquiry when it has already framed within their desired referendum? Although I welcomed the meetings about the Irish experience last week, there has been no meaningful parliamentary scrutiny of this announcement. Unlike the legitimacy, sorry, unlike the legitimacy that was achieved in Ireland with a parliamentary vote and the ability to amend. We do not be in the interest of the Citizens' Assembly to work to a more realistic timetable and allow for parliamentary scrutiny after recess. So given this context, we will offer a degree of support provided the government can prove the Citizens' Assembly is free from the government's ambition for another referendum and that Parliament has an opportunity to scrutinise the terms of reference and the remit of the Citizens' Assembly. Michael Russell. Well, I, I welcome that uh, more positive response. I'm happy to continue to provide the evidence that this is a freestanding, independent uh, initiative. I, I was glad, for example, that my old university friend Gordon Brown welcomed this uh, recently. I'm grateful for that, and I know Gordon has views about how the Citizens' Assembly should go forward. I, I make the offer here today. If Gordon wishes to discuss that with me, uh, with Claire Baker or, or on his own, I'm very happy to have that conversation. The important thing is to get on and to do things. I, I do stress, and I know Claire Baker recognises this, I do stress we are in the midst of an extraordinary constitutional crisis. The Scottish Government is trying to provide a variety of ways in which we can engage parties in this chamber in that matter. One of them is, of course, the passage of the referendum bill, and so it should be in terms of the urgency of the issue. A second one is the cross-party discussions. I've had a very detailed letter from Richard Leonard about the Labour Party participation in that, and responses taking, as taking place, and that process is moving forward, and I hope will move forward. A third one is the entirely independent business of the Citizens' Assembly of Scotland, and I am happy to continue to prove that to the member in any way I can. I move on to um, the open questions, and can I stress that I have a lot of people who wish to ask questions. Uh, Patrick Harvey, followed by Willie Rennie. Thank you. The Greens welcome the fact that most of us, at any rate, see positive value in this kind of open, participative uh, process. And in Ireland, for example, Green proposals ensured that their Citizens' Assembly could address climate change. And this is a, a demand of the growing wave of environmental activism in Scotland. Will the Cabinet Secretary tell us, in the absence of that legislative basis for the Citizens' Assembly, how does he see positive opportunities for the relationship between the Assembly and Parliament to operate? And if, for example, the Assembly chooses to address questions like where energy policy sits as part of a response to the climate emergency, they will be completely free to do so. Michael Russell. They're absolutely free to do so, and I see the relationship between the conveners of the Assembly, the Assembly members itself, and the, this Parliament as being a constructive one. And I hope the conveners, in helping to formulate the remit, uh, will be happy to discuss that with anybody who, wish it, who wishes to discuss it with them in this Parliament or outside this Parliament. I think it is wrong to see this Assembly as some sort of threat to the Parliament. I, I think one of the... Um, one of the Tory party uh, uh, candidates that didn't make it to the final two, two described it as uh, so, uh, the, the, the Citizens' Assembly as being the creature of Venezuelan tin pot dictators, even though another person in that race wanted to see Citizens' Assemblies. Let's be uh, open about the contribution that our fellow citizens can make to very serious difficulties and problems. Let's be open to them making that contribution and let's in this chamber support them to make that contribution. I'm grateful for the support from the Green Party. It is well received, and as a result of which, I think the Citizens' Assembly will be all the stronger. Willie Rennie, followed by Annabel Ewing. We are not participating in this latest SNP exercise. It has been set up simply to patch up the SNP's case for independence. Taxpayers' money should not be used for this party political process. <laughs> Now let me, ask the, let me ask the Minister this. If the Assembly begs the SNP Government to abandon independence, will it do so? Michael Russell. Well, I, I commit myself to listening to, being public about, making sure there is reported whatever the Assembly says. So if the Assembly were to say that, Mr Rennie would know that, Mr Burnett would know that if he'd stopped talking long enough to listen to actually that taking place. There would be that conversation. 
But the trouble with Mr. Rennie's position is Mr. Rennie won't allow the citizens of Scotland to actually have that opinion. They are to have no opinion because they're not allowed to meet. Now, I don't think that is liberal or democratic. And it, it does speak volumes for me that the two parties in this parliament that have set their face, set their face against involving the ordinary people of Scotland in taking forward the worst problems that we have had since this parliament was created are the Tories and the Liberal Democrats. I actually am not surprised by the Tories, though I am disappointed because I think uh, Mr. Tompkins is more open than that. I am surprised and disappointed by Mr. Rennie because it seems, it seems to me that it's far more about competing for a tiny hardline audience than actually trying to take Scotland forward. Annabel Ewing, followed by Donald Cameron. Uh, thank you, Mr. Obviously, the past three years of Brexit chaos have demonstrated the damage and harm that can be caused by an ill-informed and headline-chasing approach to fundamental constitutional change. Can the Cabinet Secretary confirm how a citizens' assembly would be able to do things differently? Michael Russell. I do think that if uh, at any stage over the last three years the current Prime Minister had said to herself, I really need to listen to other people. I really need to think about the other options that exist. She could have convened a citizens' assembly. Indeed, the University of London, amongst with others, convened a citizens' assembly on Brexit itself. That would have been a useful thing to do. I do think that to have an open mind about how uh, opinion is formed in Scotland and how de debate takes place is really important. That was actually the important, one of the important things in the foundation of this parliament 20 years ago. And it is perhaps not surprising that the Tories oppose that too. Donald Cameron, followed by Bruce Crawford. Uh, how will this parliament and its committees be able to scrutinise the work of citizens' assemblies, their output and their cost? Michael Russell. All those matters will be open and transparent. I think Mr Cameron, if I remember correctly, was supporting a candidate in the Tory leadership who wanted to see a citizens' assembly established, and I'm glad about that. The committees of this parliament will, like everybody else, be able to look at the work of the citizens' assembly, will be able to watch what takes place, and once that is concluded, then the outcomes of that citizens' assembly will come to this parliament for action. Uh, there is absolutely openness, and transparency is the key to this. So I have no difficulty in saying whatever the citizens' assembly does, whatever it spends, should be totally open and transparent, and should be subject, of course, to scrutiny. Bruce Crawford, followed by Alex Rowley. Thank you, President. The, the Citizens' Assembly is just one strand of the Scottish Government's approach to chart a distinctive approach for Scotland's future. And I note that the Cabinet Secretary has previously encouraged views and contributions from across the political spectrum. Now, we've heard the negativity and the criticism today, but what productive steps or positive suggestions have been brought to the table by any members of the opposition? Michael Russell. Well, am I hoping, as they say. Um, I would have thought that at this particular juncture, if any party in this chamber looked around and saw the enormous mess that has been created by the UK government and by the Tory party, there's no doubt about that. They looked at that. Great, Mr. Simpson is laughing at that. I think it's not really very funny. The governor of the Bank of England today doesn't think it's very funny. He's drawn attention to the severe economic damage that's being done by the Conservatives and by the Conservative government. That's, that's not a laughing matter. That is a severe damage to businesses in the region that uh, is represented by that member. So in all those circumstances, the correct reaction to this is to say, let us try something different. Let us try something that doesn't divide, but brings people together. And I think the measure of parties, the me the measure of parties in this chamber is whether they are flexible enough to do so. We know that the Conservatives aren't, because what they want to do is to continue that narrow division of Brexit. It will be, as we have seen, disastrous for them. 11% and falling. Alex Rowley, followed by Rhoda Mackay. President Officer, in many ways, the political systems that we have in the United Kingdom and indeed across Europe are breaking down. The party political systems are breaking down. So I don't think we should fear involving citizens in big questions and we should be willing to see how this goes. However, I would not want to rush that process and there does seem to be a bit of a rush. A, a rush. 
and that brings with it risk. So for this, those of us who believe the setting, setting up the Citizens' Assembly is the right thing to do, can the Cabinet Secretary give us an assurance that he will take whatever time is necessary to get this right? Michael Russell. I, I will, and in actual fact, the timescale, I, I believe, for example, for the establishment of the first attempt at this in Ireland was roughly the same from the timescale that we are anticipating here. So in terms of best practice for how this is done, it is not a rush. But I'm happy to give Mr. Rowley the assurance that this will take the time it needs to take, and it will be done in the best way that we can possibly do it. And I think that I hope Mr. Rowley, because I've known him for a long time, will accept my word on that matter. This is what we intend to do, and we intend to do it well. And if Mr. Rowley and others want to talk about how we do it, we're absolutely open to that. And I've said we will also be setting up the uh, pol politicians' panel and asking uh, political parties for their nominations so that the political parties can actually give their views as well. Rona Mackay, followed by Mark MacDonald. Thank you, presiding officer. Could the Cabinet Secretary confirm what work has been undertaken to learn from the successful use of citizens' assemblies in Canada, Australia, Poland and Ireland, which could be applied to its use here in Scotland? Michael Russell. I think Ronan Mackay makes a really important point. There have been examples of, of this being used in different ways and in different circumstances. In Oregon, for example, I understand the citizens' assemblies are used to quantify the debate that takes place in a, in a referendum. So the question in the referendum is defined by the citizens' assembly and the arguments on both sides. So it provides a sort of interlocutor role. There was a citizens' assembly on um, electoral reform in, 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 uh, in British Columbia, which actually did not produce a result that was eventually uh, translated into law. There, was a, there were two referenda on it. One narrowly succeeded and one narrowly failed. So there have been different and, and mixed experiences. Those who attended the event that the Irish uh, uh, um, organisers put forward last week, know that there there has been some very, very valuable experience, particularly with the Eighth Amendment to the Constitution, which many of us would have thought, as, as most in Ireland thought, was almost impossible to resolve, uh, given the, 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 the depth of feeling on both sides and the difficulty on both sides. That was done by people listening to arguments they'd never heard before. And I've made that point in this statement. If you're against citizens' assembly, you're against debate and discussion, and you're against putting ideas forward and having ideas considered on their merits. In the, uh, forgive me, presiding officer, but just let me finish on this point. In the uh, Eighth Amendment um, process, one of the five sessions in the Citizens' Assembly was given over to 17 advocacy organizations that brought uh, information and views to bear. They all had to submit papers which were peer-reviewed and uh, uh, they had to be factually based. And one of the members said they were hearing things they had never heard before. I hope the members in Scotland of the Citizens' Assembly will hear things about uh, Scotland, about how Scotland goes forward that they have never heard before, because that means that Scotland will hear that as well. And that's a valuable contribution. I still have a few members who wish to ask questions, so brevity in questions and answers is required if we're to get everyone in. Mark MacDonald, followed by Tom Arthur. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary alluded to the briefing that was given by Irish officials um, last week, which I thank him for. Um, one of the points made by Arto Leary was that one of the things which defined the initial constitutional convention was that members of parliament were involved within the membership of that constitutional convention, and that created a sense of ownership of the conclusions, which perhaps has not existed in other places, such as, for example, British Columbia and Iceland, where there has been seen to be a disconnect between the conclusions of assemblies and what is actually put into practice by parliamentarians. Does the cabinet secretary take a view as to whether that's an approach that is worth exploring with the citizens' assembly, at least in its initial stage? Michael Russell. It's a very important point, and I thank Mark McDonald for it. The difference between the convention and the citizens' assembly was that uh, there were 33 politicians and 66 members, other members in the convention. There were no politicians in the citizens' assembly. I think the experience was that the second model worked better. But there was an issue about how you took the outcomes and implemented them. There was a commitment in the Citizens' Assembly that that would be done by parliamentary committee. So in other words, when the Citizens' Assembly came to a conclusion, as it did on the Eighth Amendment, that would become the subject for a parliamentary committee. I am asking the Assembly, and I will ask the conveners, to look at what they think the best way forward for them would be in terms of how they plug into this parliament, and I'm open to ideas about that, so that the outcomes that they have contribute in a clear and positive way. It would also be utterly wrong to ask 120 people to spend their time and be involved and not to say to them, 
that what they do will have consequences and will have positive consequences. And therefore, we need to find the right way to do so. Tom Arthur, followed by Jamie Green. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To address any concern around the select number of people who may serve on the Assembly, would the Cabinet Secretary say how the wider public and organisations will be able to con contribute their views to any Citizens' Assembly to ensure that others can be involved in this important conversation about Scotland's future? Michael Russell. The uh, examples elsewhere tend to indicate that the Citizens' Assembly, and I don't want to tie their hands, but the Citizens' Assembly will call for evidence. Uh, and they will want people to submit evidence. I've had a, a large number of uh, people contact me in the last few weeks to say that they want to be involved in the process. I'm grateful to all of them for so doing. I think it's now up to the Citizens' Assembly as it formulates the, the, the remit that it has uh, to put themselves in a position where they're then asking for contributions to the length and breadth of Scotland, to Civic Scotland from individuals and others. Sometimes the numbers are large. I mean, on the Eighth Amendment, there were 13,000 uh, submissions. They were all up on the website so people could look at them. And some other subjects like, uh, for example, the um, fixed term parliaments, I think there were only a, ha a handful. But the, where there is uh, interest, then people will have the opportunity to, 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 to give information. The website is now open, you can begin to register your interest in it, and I hope this will become a dynamic process. Jamie Green, followed by Jenny Mara. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary wants a 120 member appointed Citizens' Assembly to work out what kind of country we want to build. So let me ask him, why does he think the 129 member democratically accountable elected parliament that Scotland already has cannot fulfill this task? Michael because Russell. there is a different type of debate to be had. I mean, this is, a, this is a criticism that is often made in the early stages of establishing citizens' assemblies in a variety of countries. The politicians say, well, we're here, we can do this. The nature of the debate is different. Actually, I can demonstrate that by this debate here. We, we've had exclusivity from uh, Mr. Rennie, who, who wants to stay out of everything. We've had condemnation from the Tories, who don't want to have anything to do with it. The reality is, in the Citizens' Assembly, the facts are presented, and they're presented in a way that is meant to be impartial. There is a range of information that is available. People have the opportunity to deliberate and they can come to conclusions. That strikes me as what a parliament might aspire to, but hardly ever achieves. But in a citizens' assembly, it's the heart of the work that we do. And I would hope that would become clear very quickly. The last question is to Jenny Mara. I know the Cabinet Secretary is not a fearful man, but it seems to me from this statement this afternoon that he's a little bit fearful of parliamentary, parliamentary scrutiny of the remit of the Citizens' Assembly. And we know, as Patrick Harvey raised, that the climate change issue in Ireland was considered by the Citizens' Assembly as a result of an amendment in Parliament. I think the Irish example gave the Citizens' Assembly legitimacy because of the parliamentary scrutiny. Will he give the Scottish Parliament the final say on the remit of the Assembly? Michael Russell. The final say on the remit of the Assembly must come from the Assembly. I mean, it would be completely ridiculous if we got ourselves to the position where we were saying, we'll tell you what to think. But I will give Jenny Mara the uh, guarantee that the full-hearted participation the engagement with, the scrutiny of the Citizens' Assembly is very important. If Jenny Murray would stop waving a piece of paper, I'm trying to answer a question. The reality of the situation is we want the parties in this parliament to engage closely with the Citizens' Assembly. This is an experiment in democracy for Scotland. Let us be open to that experiment. Let us not find ourselves in the position of trying to close down parts of that experiment before we've even started. That concludes questions on progress in establishing the Citizens' Assembly of Scotland, Scotland's constitutional future. And we'll move on to the next item of business. Apologies to Gail Ross and Graham Simpson, who weren't able to ask the requested questions. <laughs>